Now that we've spent a what seems to be an inordinate amount of time studying systems without control, we're going to finally start talking about control and purposes of controlling dynamic systems. So our first stab at this will be not using feedback. And so today we're just looking at what happens if we use open loop techniques, so um, control techniques that don't include feedback. What happens when we do that um, to try to control our systems? Um, what, do, what kind of effects do we see? So one of the, we said at the beginning of the course, we're going to take a look at um, our ability to control and we're, uh, the, see these systems and we're going to evaluate that based on four key control goals. And so we haven't really talked a lot about each of these because they're really control goals. They're not just system goals. Um, the one that we have seen a little bit of is stability. So we're going to talk about how open loop control systems um, uh, essentially affects stability, uh, how we achieve that goal. We're going to talk about tracking, this notion of being able to follow some sort of reference input. Um, we're going to talk about whether or not open loop control is able to, to provide any sort of disturbance rejection. So that means are they uh, essentially insensitive to um, disturbances or to noise. And then finally, what happens when we um, start changing the system? How robust are these techniques? Um, if the system changes a little bit, how do our open loop control uh, techniques still work? So we're going to come back and take a look at these four um, different control goals from the perspective of open loop control. So we're going to dive back into block diagrams. And so the idea of open loop control is that we have some sort of desired reference. And if you remember from our the kind of the beginning discussions of the course, this could be, for example, the a set point. So something like the speed you want your car to go. And, um, and so then the job of the control system is to make sure that the output Y follows the reference R. So we're trying to make y equal to r. That's the ideal case. But because these, these systems are dynamic, um, it would be uh, impractical to, to expect that to be the case all the time. Um, but so we'd like it that if y looks like something very close to r. Um, so uh, to compose this, uh, this expression, uh, what we want to do is we want to rely again on our understanding of block diagram algebra and the ability of the Laplace transform to give us some nice convenient ways of manipulating these. So for example, in this first block, we know that the controller, um, essentially u, which is the output of this block, u, u of s is going to be written as the transfer function k of s multiplied by the input r of s. So that's an equation that we know, and that's based on the input-output relationship of the controller. So this sum, this right here is, this circle right here is a sum. And so that means on this edge right here, this is the combination of u of s plus w of s. And because these, this signal and this signal, so this is a disturbance signal being uh, entered into the system, and this is the control input U, and they're going to get added together here before it goes into the plant. And so now based on the plant input-output relationship, we know that let's call this, um, let's just give it a letter because we don't have a letter right here, so let's call this Z. So we can say that Z of S is equal to G, the transfer function G, multiplied by what's coming in, and what's coming in is this whole sum. So u of s plus w of s. And then this again is a sum, and so that means that on this edge right here is the sum z plus v. And what that means is that z plus v has to be equal to y. All right, so um, essentially, there's lots and lots of different ways to substitute all these in. Um, essentially, in this expression right here, I've done that rather quickly, um, but we could we could think about doing that a little bit more slowly. For example, we could say y is equal to z plus v. I'm going to leave off the of s uh, parentheses just uh, for a brief brevity here. So now we don't have any more information about V, but we know that Z, so here we have that Z is equal to 
g of s times u plus w. So now we can expand this and we can say that this is g times u plus w plus v. And now we can say, okay, well, w doesn't have any more information about it, but u, we can write u in terms of k and r. So that means that y is again equal to g, and now we rewrite u as k times r plus w plus v. And so now we got essentially the same thing as we have here. And if I were to just expand that out into several terms, we have this expression right here. And the way that I want you to look at this is that there are three signals that are coming into this control system. There's the reference, which is what we're commanding it. There's a disturbance. This we don't get to a choose we just have to deal with it and we also have noise for example here this is sensor noise that's that's perturbing our actual measurement so these are the three terms these three external inputs external signals that we need to deal with one of them is what we want two of them are things we don't like but we have to deal with and so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at how the output so that's that's what our system is actually doing, how that is related to each of these signals. Ideally, we would like the, this term in front of the reference to be one, because we're get, again, remember that we want the output to look just like the reference. So if you command it to be 70 miles an hour, you want the output to be 70 miles an hour. Um, again, we're not always going to be able to achieve that um, ideal case, but we'd like it to be close. So we'd like this to be as close to one as possible. These terms, the coefficients in front of the noise and the disturbance, we'd like those to be zero, or we'd like the, those, the influence of those terms to be zero. And so we'll be looking at what, uh, essentially how this disturbance affects the output and how the noise affects the output. If we're very robust or very um, insensitive um, to these terms, um, their influence on the output would be zero. But as you can see in this open loop formulation, that's not quite true. Um, so along the way, it's also going to be interesting to think about the what we call the tracking error. So we'll use the, the capital letter E there. And that is simply the difference between the reference and the output. So again, if we want the output Y to look like the reference, so again, you want 70 miles an hour, uh, essentially the error is telling you how far away you are so if you wanted refer the reference to be 70 uh, that's what you want the system to be doing the system's only doing 68 then you're you've got an error of two so that's what this quantifies and so if we go ahead and calculate what this is it's simply just r and then minus the terms that we just got uh, up here and so if we just combine like terms this changes the error now has a transfer function with respect to the reference that looks like 1 minus gk and then we've essentially negated we have minus g in front of w and we have now have minus 1 in front of v so now this would be the transfer function with respect to the reference to the tracking error and this would be the transfer function of the uh, the output now y with respect to the reference r okay so again we want to we want to achieve the output to look like the reference so if you look at this and if you think that you want this to be one then if we go ahead and call our transfer function we remember our transfer functions are typically ratios of polynomials so just think about this as a polynomial and this as a polynomial so if g is given by b over a then what if we took our controller transfer function simply to be the reciprocal of that so it would be a over b so now everything would cancel out and that would leave us with this transfer this expression that looks like this and now the transfer function that represents how the outputs related to the reference is just a one which is that perfect ideal case um, and so this looks really really good so far so we've done a uh, essentially a controller and the the way that we often call this is it's called model inversion and so this is the idea that you use a 
essentially kind of the inverted version of your model to represent what your controller should be doing. So now let's start to take a look at this approach from our four different control goals. So question is, how do we do with tracking? How are we doing with tracking? So by virtue of the fact that this is coefficient, this transfer function between Y and R is a one, the tracking is actually quite good. Um, the only problem though is, is that tracking is not simply just the contribution of this one term. It's also the contribution of all of these terms. And so if there are no disturbances, so that's W being zero, and there is no sensor noise, that's V being zero, then we get exact tracking. Again, that sounds really good. And in practice, um, sometimes it is good. Um, but essentially, these terms need to be small for Y to look like R. If these terms are moderately large or you know, medium size, then that can make a, sig a significant change so that Y no longer looks exactly like R. We can get some essentially um, a discrepancy between what we want and what we end up getting. So tracking can be good uh, in open loop if your uncertainties and disturbances are small. Another important part is that if this is not zero, if this disturbance is not zero, then this G term really needs to be stable. If this isn't stable, then that means that there could be terms in the solution that would blow up. And so it's really important that this G be originally a stable system. Many physical systems tend to be stable, but there are a lot of ones that we design in engineering systems that aren't stable. And there's a very compelling um, and kind of a cool relationship between the fact that like a system that is very, very stable is sometimes relatively hard to control. Um, and so, for example, high performance aircraft are often made to be unstable because that means that they can respond quicker, um, whereas a stable one certainly stays in the, in the sky very well. But that means that it maybe doesn't have the same kind of turning radiuses and things like that. So there's some, there are some performance advantages to um, changing and making a system to be unstable. So anyway, it's a very real, uh, real possibility of this system G may not be stable and that could be a big problem if we have um, if we have disturbances on our system um, so again tracking tracking can be good with a lot of very important caveats if we take a look at stability now um, stability is if g is stable um, again this is the same discussion that we just had if g is stable then the open loop can work but if G is unstable, then small disturbances can cause a very large change in the output. And so that means that this system is not very stable from the perspective of tracking. So uh, on a similar vein, um, notice that the controller, if we look back up here at this original statement about what Y is, the controller only appears here in the reference. It doesn't appear here and it doesn't appear here. And so that means that in terms of disturbance rejection, there is nothing that the controller transfer function does to help reduce sensitivity to disturbances or to the noise. So both of these terms, there's nothing we can affect these terms with in terms of K. So K doesn't appear there, so it means that we can't do a whole lot about it. Um, in fact, what this is saying is that the, the sensor noise appears directly in the output. So if you have noise, you directly get it in terms of your output. Um, and so this is, this is our, uh, what we can say in terms of generic open loop performance uh, with respect to these three control goals. And now the final one, we're going to take a look at, a, at how we think about uh, the notion of robustness of open loop control design. So this is a busy slide and this is an important one to come back to because it's going to be a lot more complicated once we get to closed loop control. So the notion um, of sensitivity to modeling errors, this is one of our ways to um, quantify how robust a system is um, and how robust is its control uh, approach. So when we do open loop, uh, we're going to be analyzing that open loop transfer function, so that's or that that open loop expression for the output, which includes the transfer functions with respect to um, the reference and any sort of disturbance. 
So we're going to take a look at this and we're going to evaluate how the output changes if our plant model is not quite right or if it changes. So if this is the actual system and this is the model of what we have, so you could think back to those simplified transfer functions that we looked at in lab two. Here you have an actual plant and it could be relatively complicated and we're going to approximate it with another one so that there's some either uncertainty or something, some error that's about our model. Maybe we, we got rid of it on purpose, maybe we didn't, maybe we just didn't know about it. Or it could be that maybe this the actual dynamic is changing over time and even though you had a perfect model before, now there's now there's introduced some extra perturbation um, because of some gradual wear and tear. So what we're interested in doing is understanding how sensitive is the output to changes in the plant model. And notice this is different than changes that uh, essentially disturbances being present or um, or uh, noise being present. So now this is a different kind of uncertainty and that comes from this model inaccuracy. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at this expression and we're gonna say that um, in particular, we're gonna look at the robustness, how sensitive is the tracking of, um, of our reference to this model inaccuracy. So if we're using this G bar um, and we are using this controller K, then that quantifies how the reference is related to the output. And so we're going to call this a transfer function T. Okay. And what we want to do is we want to know the way that we're going to quantify how well we're tracking is we're going to see how, how much this T transfer function changes when we have this perturbation due to uncertainty in the model. Okay, so we're gonna define this T transfer function. And so the sensitivity of a transfer function is simply the amount that that transfer function changes related to its nominal value divided by the amount that we changed the system, that uncertainty in the model, divided by the nominal model. And what's important here is we're normalizing by the T and G in each case because it kind of matters how much you're changing it relative to um, relative to the the uh, the actual model. So this is the whole idea of like if you were to add say one gram to a bowling ball versus one gram to a ping pong ball. One gram to a ping pong ball is a lot bigger deal than one gram to a bowling ball. So the idea is to normalize by T and G so that you get an accurate representation of the sensitivity of the of this kind of initial change and then how that changes it in the in the transfer function T. So let's go ahead and plug in G bar right here. So G bar is G plus delta G. So we're going to plug that in here and that's where I get this. So now I get G plus delta G times k. And so that's our new transfer function. And that's our that's essentially our transfer function. Um, that's our that's so before we had t. And so now what we're going to do the new transfer function is going to be that original t plus some perturbation amount. All right? So I'm kind of deciding to to try to represent this this new transfer function due to this variation in terms of the old transfer function and the, um, the perturbation. And the reason why this is useful is because we'd like to be able to normalize by this t, so it's kind of handy to be able to write this expression in terms of what we had originally and then what we had um, due to this perturbation of delta g. So when we expand this term out, we get a gk and a delta g times k. And this GK is the form that we had over here. So it's simply just our nominal model times the, con the uh, controller transfer function. And so that matches up with what our original T uh, transfer function was. And then the bit that comes from the perturbation is this delta T, which is what's left over, this additive term here that's left over. So this is the, 
the amount that the model changed by the by the controller transfer function so when we plug this in we get delta t so delta t is delta g k so that's this term and then we're going to divide that by t and t is g k so g k and then we're going to just divide by um, delta g over g and so we have a common factor of k here so those cancel and that just leaves us with delta g over delta uh, delta g over g divided by delta g over g and so those are the same things and so the sensitivity is going to be this value one and what does that mean that means that when we change delta g by some amount this transfer function here that represents the mapping from the reference to the output gets changed by that same amount and because we're talking about relative relative quantities we're going to say if we change the nominal model of the system by 10 percent then that means that the tracking transfer function gk is also going to change by 10 percent and then and that's not terribly mind-blowing because this is simply just g times k and what we're saying is we're just changing g but the idea here is is that if I change the the model by some percentage I'm going to get an equally bad percentage degradation in my tracking so this t represents how well I'm tracking I'd like that to be near one if I was already near one if my controller was tuned so that I was getting near to one performance and I changed my model by 10 percent now I'm either getting 90 percent or I'm getting 110 percent of my original reference so and that's bad and and one way of thinking the reason why that's bad is because this controller k is not doing anything to reduce this 10 percent so here i introduce a 10 percent variation and my controller does nothing to mitigate that and so um, what we'll see in closed loop control is that one of the things when we do the analysis of sensitivity is that we improve this number so if I introduce a 10% variation in, in the model, we get less variation in the output than we do in the open loop case. So uh, what we've done here is we've identified a few key um, deficiencies in open loop control using open loop control. What we're going to see in one of our labs eventually is the fact that we're that really the solution to, is to use both open loop and closed loop control there's a lot of both of that going on in the in the kind of practical control community in industry um, but the it is that feedback control that's going to finally um, give us a lot of the important characteristics such as stability and tracking and robustness and disturbance rejection um, this is um, you can get directionally correct with open loop control, but it's really feedback that's going to take us the last mile and, and make sure that our systems are well behaved and perform uh, according to these four key criteria. So that's where we're going, and uh, that's what we'll be talking about in the third section of the course.